Wow, so yesterday the Bank of Canada told us its plan for changing interest rates and this was the big announcement people were waiting for. But the craziest part of the news is something that nobody has been talking about. Something that has been relegated to the footnotes of most of the mainstream media's reporting. Something going on behind the scenes that impacts every single Canadian financially. Now, we've all heard about the potential impending or current recession, depending on who you believe. Uh, when interest rates increased rapidly, it had tons of negative impacts on Canadian businesses and made it more expensive for businesses to borrow money to grow, less spending from Canadians as a result uh, due to increased costs of borrowing with these higher interest rates. But despite all of these reasons that the economy should be struggling, it's actually doing pretty well, at least that is if you believe these government stats. In the quick facts section on the finance minister, Christian Freeland's website, she lists a whole bunch of different positive things that are happening in the Canadian economy. Um, this first one being in 2023, Canada avoided the shallow recession expected by some economists with GDP rising by 1.1% for the year, which is three times higher than what she herself predicted in 2023. So that sounds pretty good, but I don't think it gives us the whole picture, and trust me, this all connects to why the Bank of Canada is doing what it's doing and has done what it's done, and how that's going to impact you. You see, it is 100% true that Canada's economy has grown over the past year by 1.1%, which is a lot higher than what a lot of people expected, but that is just Canada's GDP, or gross domestic product, a measure of the uh, total economic activity in the country. But when we look at the numbers, when you take that number and divide it by the amount of people in Canada, well, we get a vastly different story with actually the GDP per person or per capita D declining over the past number of years. So why does the GDP number look like it's going up then? Well, we can attribute that to a massive growth in population in Canada. Um, because we're adding more and more people to the country, there's more and more spending in the economy, more and more people working and producing goods and services, this results in more economic activity. But when you look at the entire output of the country by the amount of people that are in the country, well, things are getting worse. By the way, you can get access to the sources for these videos and uh, additional bonus content by joining my mailing list. You can check that link out in the description if that's something you're interested in. But uh, despite the clear recession that we're in, if we look at these GDP per capita numbers and spending per capita, well, the Bank of Canada looks at the GDP numbers, the headline GDP numbers, as well as inflation data. And just yesterday, they decided that no, they cannot lower interest rates because they're too afraid that lowering rates would cause Canadians to go out and spend more and lead to inflation round two, something that they're terrified of after a similar situation played out in the late 70s and early 80s, which required the Bank of Canada to go through a second round of painful and fast interest rate hikes. So the Bank of Canada decided yet again to hold rates at 5%. But this is where things get really interesting because nobody's talking about one very real factor that could be the real reason the Bank of Canada is worried. But first, a quick thank you to today's video's sponsor. I want to thank the sponsor of today's video, Private Internet Access. Now, Private Internet Access is a VPN which allows you to hide your IP address and encrypt your internet connection. Private Internet Access is the VPN that I use, and let me tell you why. I'm not an expert when it comes to internet network security. I don't do anything sketchy that I wouldn't want people seeing, but I realize that with enough seemingly innocent pieces of information about my digital life, a bad actor could put together a pretty accurate profile of who I am and what I do. So using private internet access gives me the peace of mind that my internet connection is secure, free from any potential monitoring. All of this is in addition to some of the more well-known benefits of a VPN, like giving you access to more content on streaming services by making them think you're in another country, allowing you to view that country's catalog of content. Also, more and more Canadians are becoming less trusting of their government in connection with Bill C-11 and C-18, which restrict your access to certain content on social media platforms. So one of the only ways to bypass these changes is to connect to a VPN to shield your location information. Now, private internet access has been downloaded over 30 million times and has an independently audited no logs policy that makes sure that none of your personal data is ever stored by them. Uh, and private internet access has given me a special link that you can use to get 83% off of their typical pricing, bringing it down to just over $2 a month with a bonus of four months for free. And all of this has a 30 day money back guarantee. 
So a huge thank you goes out to Private Internet Access for sponsoring today's video and make sure to use the link in the description to check out Private Internet Access today. In the press conference that the Bank of Canada just gave, they talked about one thing that really surprised them and that was the strength of the US economy uh, and the recent investment performances of American companies. Um, just take a look at this, this is the S&P 500 which just over the past six months has gone up by 15%. Now in, in a usual year in an average year this tends to go up anywhere between six and eight percent so 15 percent in just six months is rather unheard of and a similar and more extreme story can be said about even more of a volatile asset than stocks, and that's cryptocurrency. We've seen Bitcoin go up by 152% in the past six months, and Ethereum go up by 132% just over the past six months. So what's going on here? Equities or stocks, as well as crypto, are all considered risk on assets, or assets that tend to be more volatile but do well in low interest rate environments where uh, low interest rates pump up investments and investors seek out uh, more risky investments to pump up their returns. And this is something that the Bank of Canada is admittedly thinking about. Here's a clip from the press conference that just happened yesterday with Deputy, uh, uh, Deputy Governor of the Bank of Canada, Carolyn Rogers, commenting on just this. We've seen record heights uh, recently, um, but there's a concern that this can be a bubble. And do you think that's going to uh, uh, make your policy making more challenging going forward? Uh, well, I mean, I, the stock market is something we watch. We watch generally um, financial conditions. Uh, we've noted the same thing you have. There does look to be uh, um, sort of some exuberance in, in equities. Um, we're not really in the business of forecasting uh, stock prices. Uh, I think in general what the markets are doing is the same thing you're all doing here today, which is trying to understand uh, when we'll see a, a pivot to, to lower rates. So um, we'll continue to monitor it. She says that the huge run-up for these higher risk assets is because people are speculating on when central banks will lower rates, essentially saying that the people are, are buying up these assets and they're trying to be ahead of the curve, making the bet that rates will drop and these high risk assets will skyrocket in value. But right now, we haven't seen any rate cuts yet, and these types of assets are already booming, possibly from so many people trying to go for this timing the market investment strategy. There's one problem here though, if these assets are booming even before rates are lowered, what do you think will happen when those rates are actually lowered? I think that this could be a fear of the Bank of Canada and of other central banks like the Federal Reserve in the United States, that if they perhaps lower rates now, they could pour gasoline on this fire, boosting the value of these assets and making Canadians and, and Americans as well feel more wealthy, leading to more and more consumer spending, increasing demand and as a result, we get that second round of inflation that the Bank of Canada is so incredibly afraid of. Now this all has some very real impacts for average Canadians. It impacts their jobs, their businesses, and what they should be doing with their money, but we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, but all of this doesn't just apply to stocks and crypto. This same sort of speculation looks like it could be happening within the real estate market as well. Governor, are you keeping rates, um, <clears throat> you've signaled that you're not discussing rate relief at this time. Um, are you trying to keep rates at an elevated level to coincide with the spring home sales season and ensure that inflation doesn't, that activity doesn't, that activity doesn't pick up too quickly in housing and put further upward pressure on inflation? Look, the message is it's working. Inflation's coming down, we're making progress. Uh, yes, there will come a time when it's time to cut rates. Uh, that time is not now. Coming back to the housing market, we expect some rebound in housing. So we've built some rebound in to our projection. Could that rebound be stronger than, we've, uh, than we have expected? Yes, it could. Uh, and and that, is, that is an upside risk. There are other risks. We're looking at the balance of risks overall. We're not targeting the housing sector. We're targeting inflation, and we've got to look at the whole economy. 
He says that a stronger rebound in housing is a risk, especially if they were to lower rates too soon. However, he also kind of makes it clear that housing isn't in the Bank of Canada's mandate, so even if housing blasts off again, the Bank of Canada might not take that so heavily into consideration, especially if the overall inflation numbers remain low. Now, uh, the problem with this is that, I mean, this might sound a little bit backwards, but lowering rates could actually bring inflation down, at least when it comes to housing, even if that means that house prices climb upwards. Now, let me explain. Uh, despite the increased spending that could come from the wealth effect that Canadians feel as their homes increase in value, simultaneously, one of the biggest housing inflation measures would come down, and that's mortgage interest costs. Central banks lowering their rates means that Canadians pay less interest on their home loans, lowering this measure of inflation. Now, all this to say, we could see a world where the Bank of Canada lets house prices absolutely rip up again because they aren't mandated to consider housing prices only general inflation. So today's home buyers, and stock investors, and crypto investors are all putting their chips on the table. They're, they're going all in, making the bet that rates will come down, driving up the prices of the things that they're buying, the things that they own. This is the extreme, extreme power of forward guidance, the often used tool of central banks where instead of doing something, they simply tell you that they're going to do something ahead of time just to see how the market is going to respond before they actually do it. And markets right now are acting like rates have already been cut because so many people are convinced that they will be cut in the future. And when you get close up to it, this might just look like some market funny business. Uh, who, who really cares? The number's going up. And nobody's really getting hurt. But when you take a step back and look at this from a, a thousand foot view, you realize that it has some very real impacts for very real people. This article from March 6th, 2024 says that Canadian business insolvencies or bankruptcies have soared to the highest level in nearly 20 years. Let's take a closer look at this chart. We see this absolute uh, run up of the amount of businesses um, filing for in insolvency, right? Uh, I, I think with rates being held at higher levels, at least relative to the past two decades, it makes it harder for businesses to borrow money to expand their businesses, making it harder to just operate a business in general. Uh, many businesses have razor thin margins and even a slight bump in rates can increase a business's borrowing costs while also reducing consumer demand for their products and services, uh, leading many businesses to just go belly up like we're seeing here. And I think this section puts it well. The, the insolvency issue is just part of the growing picture of an eroding business landscape. Insolvency is a formal debt mitigation tool, but even more businesses are just shuttering their doors. Now, at the same time, despite a surge in population, fewer people are starting new businesses in Canada, an issue that makes more and more sense as investors see more opportunity abroad than they do in Canada's debt-heavy housing economy. This all just feels really weird. There's a disconnect here, a disconnect of having a lack of growth in the economy while also having booming stock prices uh, paired with the way that the central bank is reacting to all this information. I think it can have a negative consequence or many negative consequences for people who are hoping to get more financial support from their governments. This is another angle. Christa Freeland, the finance minister for Canada, just announced that she'll be tabling the next budget on April 16th at 4 p.m. By the way, tune into the channel. We'll be doing a live stream of it. Um, but these budgets are generally where the government sort of lays out, hey, here's how we're going to spend our money for the, the next number of years. Here's who's going to get money. Who, here's who's not. Here's our general financial plan. But rates can have a big impact here too, and I don't think people often realize the way that rates impact government actions. With rates high, governments have to pay more interest on the loans that they take on in order to finance all of the different government programs that they're spending on. And that's exactly the situation that Freeland and Justin Trudeau and the Liberals find themselves in right now. They may, in theory, want to increase government spending to implement programs that they help will or that they think will help Canadians financially. Um, they they definitely would want to do that leading up to an election. You want to make people happy, right? But in reality, they might refrain from doing so due to the higher debt costs that they'd face if they were to take on additional debt to implement these programs. Um, not to mention, on top of all of that, they have this desire to ditch their reputation that they've. Uh, uh, 
kind of earned as financially irresponsible. Now you can debate in the comments section until the cows come home about what programs should or shouldn't be in place and how much spending the government should or shouldn't do in relation to that impact on inflation that government spending has. But one thing is crystal clear and is definitely certain. Many Canadians are struggling right now, and, and whether they're helped via uh, the government intervention, via uh, benefits and subsidies, or by a reduction in the cost of living, uh, both of those categories don't seem that likely to me to happen right now. And it sucks that I don't see much relief coming for Canadians over the next year. But if you're having a hard time making sense of all of this, don't worry, you are not alone. I'm just like anyone else, sharing my thoughts here on what I think's going on, but nobody really knows for certain. Uh, the economy is a complex web of cause and effect relationships that nobody can really predict for certain. And nobody has a crystal ball, and if anyone is on YouTube or anywhere else telling you that they know for certain what will happen, that, at least to me, is an immediate red flag. But there is some evergreen advice that I've found to be true, and it might sound obvious. It's not a silver bullet, but here it is. A quick disclaimer, this isn't the specific financial advice for you. This is just a launching point for you to make your own decisions. First, do your best to make and save as much money as you possibly can. I know that sounds obvious, but beside hustles or learning a higher income skill or reducing your expenses by making lifestyle sacrifices, all of this can help dramatically. Now, as a result of doing that, with any money left over, do your best to establish an emergency fund that can cover three to six months of your living expenses so that in the event you lose your income source, you have some time to figure things out. Uh, now, if you make it to that point, and you're doing pretty well if you've made it to that point, and you're ready to invest, for most people, it's best to dollar cost average into low fee index ETFs over time. Uh, by making small contributions regularly, you can reduce your risk of investing at the wrong time, and by investing in a large basket of the biggest companies using index ETFs, you reduce your risk of losing it all on one bad bet. Now, over a long enough time horizon, this strategy tends to do well and it's really passive right you don't have to be looking at it every single day you just contribute regularly over time and if you're doing exceedingly well and you're looking at getting into the real estate market, make sure that you could afford a worst case scenario where rates go even higher from here and you're forced to increase your payment amounts. And that additionally, if at all possible, look at getting into properties that have the secondary rental potential. Um, does the property have a basement suite that you can rent out? Uh, could you add a roommate and reduce your mortgage costs as a result? Maybe you have an extra garage or, or some storage space that you could rent out. All of these options can help to limit your risk when you take this big financial step. Now, all of that might sound obvious to some and very lofty in terms of goals for others, but ultimately you can't depend on anyone but yourself when it comes to your financial future. The government's not going to help you. You got to save yourself. So I think that all of this should be at everyone's top of mind at all times. But I'm curious what you think about all of this. What do you think of the Bank of Canada's decision to keep it at 5%? Do you think they're doing so because of the strength of the economy, and at least in terms of stock prices? Do you think that they're making a mistake here and maybe are uh, sort of overshooting here, keeping rates too high for too long, and that could result in a nasty recession down the road? Um, what have I gotten right? What have I gotten wrong? I'm just trying to figure things out. Let me know. We're all trying to learn here. Uh, and if you haven't already done so, make sure to subscribe to the channel. I already mentioned the newsletter where you can get additional sources and bonus content uh, from me. You can check that link in the description and uh, sign up there. But with all that said, thanks so much for watching this video, everybody. I really hope this video helped you out at least a little bit, and I'll see you next time.